Welcome back to the band guide where we use garage band to create professional sounding music. I'm your band guy, Colin. And today, first and foremost, I want to say happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is actually my favorite holiday, believe it or not, because it's all about being thankful and appreciative of what you have and those around you, those in your life. And something that I'm incredibly thankful for this year is you. I started the band guide a little over a year ago, and this year has been full of amazing people making amazing music and supporting the channel and supporting me and sharing what I've in some small way helped them make, and that's just so cool to me. So thank you first and foremost. I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Okay, let's jump into the first thing you need to learn, the most powerful tool that you have in GarageBand to make your music sound great, to make your music sound professional. You've already heard a snippet from the beginning of this video, but let's listen to a little bit of it again, and I want to highlight to you how before we've applied this tool across our mix, it sounds extremely dull, extremely dark, extremely muddy, and as soon as we apply this tool across our mix, it sounds clear, it sounds full, we can hear the vocals a little bit better, we can hear the low end better, it doesn't sound muddy, things don't sound covered up, and it has more energy, it's a little more alive feeling. So listen for those things as we check out the before and after. I wish you were here Kind of crazy, right? And that's only one tool applied across the mix. There's no other changes. There's no volume changes. There's no changes to the mix in any way other than applying that tool across the mix. Now, you might be able to guess what it is. I'm not hiding it. You can see it in that video. We're using EQ on our master track and on our individual tracks. And with just that one tool, we get a bigger sounding mix, a fuller sounding mix, a brighter sounding mix. We have more energy in our mix. We can hear everything more clearly. And we're only using one tool to accomplish that. So in today's video, I wanna make the case that that is the first tool that you need to learn. EQ has a completely disproportionate effect on your mix. There's six steps in the mixing process and you need to be doing all of them. If you don't already have my six step checklist to a pro mix, be sure to grab that. But EQ is completely disproportionate in its effect on your mix. It is the tool that you need to learn first if you want your mixes to sound clear and professional. Every professional mix is using EQ all over the place. So in today's video, I wanna give you the main objectives of EQ, some tips for using it to get a more professional sounding mix, and then show you largely how I've used it across this mix so you can see that there's no secrets to this, just subtle small moves across individual channels that add up to a lot clearer, brighter, fuller final product. So let's go ahead and just open up one EQ. Let's talk about what we've done with this EQ. So with any EQ, you have three main goals. Minimize the bad, highlight the good, and make space for every source. So with this EQ, we're doing those three things with just three small moves. We're making space for every source by cutting out anything below about 134 hertz. So anywhere from here down gets cut out. That helps make space for other sources that need those frequencies to sound great in the mix, right? So our upright bass uses those frequencies. Our piano and our acoustic guitar even uses some of those frequencies. And then we've done a small cut around 270. So if you look down here, there's the frequencies highlighted. Around 270, in this case, we're cutting a little bit of those frequencies because they just don't sound particularly great. Listen to them in solo here. They're a little bit muddy. So by cutting those, we accomplish two objectives. One, we get to hear the other frequencies in the mandolin better. And two, we also make a little more space for other sources that need those frequencies in this mix. And then finally, in this case, we did a fairly large, just high shelf across all of these upper frequencies here, bumped up these higher frequencies, and these really stand out as sounding great for this individual mandolin. So if we listen here, these frequencies here just really are the sweet spot for this mandolin. So I found these kind of in the context of the mix. My favorite way to find frequencies that work on an individual source is listen to it with everything else. So if we take it back out of solo, what I like to do, if you've not set any other plugins after your EQ, 
in your plugin chain here, none of them are on, then you can just bump up this volume here. So you can now hear the mandolin better and you can boost up and find that sweet spot where it sounded really, really good. And then just scale it back to something a little bit more reasonable and set your volume back. And then you know that that frequency works well on that source in the context of this mix. And then once you've set that and you've set your volume back here, this is your output volume from your EQ, go back and solo and just listen and make sure that the volume is the same with and without this EQ on. So it's about the same volume with and without this EQ on, so you don't necessarily need to volume balance it here. That allows us to do two things. One, it protects us from throwing off our static mix. So at the start of the mixing process, you should set your individual volume levels on your individual tracks, make sure that everything is exactly where it should be. And we're protecting that by not changing the overall volume of this track by adding or taking away volume with EQ. The other thing that it does is it allows us to assess if we like the sound of that EQ, because if we're adding volume or taking away volume with our EQ, if we're doing a lot of big bumps or a lot of big cuts, then we might be hearing it differently and we tend to prefer louder things. So if you added volume, then we're actually just liking the sound of that EQ because it's making the source louder than because it is actually making it sound better. So you wanna be sure to be thinking through that, balancing those two things. So you're just making sure that it sounds better with this EQ on when the volume is actually balanced. This is a little bit muddy. This is a little bit brighter, right? So let's just do a quick overview of what we've done across EQs in this mix to make space for everything, to make everything sit where it should in the mix and to sound as good as possible. So starting with this upright bass here, this upright bass has some really great frequencies in the low end. We're cutting off below that so that it doesn't extend down forever in frequencies we can't necessarily hear well in our headphones or on our studio monitors. Uh, and then right here, there's a frequency that doesn't necessarily sound bad, but just jumps out too much. Listen to this here. When I don't have this EQ on here, this one bump here, that first note is so much louder than that second and third note, right? When I add this in, those three notes are way more similar in total volume. So I'm using this one cut here to balance that. It's kind of minimizing the bad. It's also just making everything else sit together a little bit better. And then we did a, a big low end bump because those frequencies sound really good on the source. And in the context of our mix, we needed more low end and this is our main low end source. So that really helped that out. And then a little bit around here to highlight kind of the pick noise as you're plucking the strings. So just a little bump up there. And then with the guitar, we have two channels. We have a DI. With that, we've added a little bit of brightness and we've cut out some of the low end because this wasn't the best source for that. And then with the microphone on the acoustic guitar, we cut out some of the sub frequencies. We actually boosted a little bit of the low end because that body of the acoustic had a really nice low end feel in the context of this mix. And then just a little bit of weirdness right around here, minimizing the bad, right? With the piano, we did a little bit of a bump around the low end and a little bit of bump around the brightness. If we listen to this piano in solo. Just sounds a little bit clearer, has a little bit more fullness to it. One note, when you do a couple of bumps, you also inherently are creating, kind of minimizing the quote bad of this source. So by bumping here and bumping here, I'm inherently kind of minimizing this frequency range here in the middle. So this area right here kind of gets brought down relative to these other two frequencies. So this frequency, which isn't necessarily bad, it's a little telephony, just gets kind of played down a little bit with these subtle EQ bumps. And then with the mandolin, we already took a look at that one. With the violin, very similar to the mandolin, uh, some brightness added, a little bit of this mid-range cut, and then the low-end cut because it's not part of that source. With the lead vocal, I'm actually highlighting some of these mid-range frequencies because they sound really good on this lead vocal, and then some brightness to make it more present in the mix, make it more upfront. Our ears perceive brighter things as being more upfront, closer to you in the mix. So I added brightness to the things that I wanted to bring forward in the mix 
and then either add or left more darkness in sources that I want to sit a little bit further back in the mix. Begin with this vocal here. I wish you were here and you will be next time. These frequencies sound really good. It kind of minimizes these lower frequencies here by highlighting these and then adding the brightness makes it more present. I wish you were here and you will be next time. Very, very subtle, but makes a big difference in the context of the mix. And then we have the lead female vocalist. Again, we're just bringing it forward with a little more brightness, making it a little bit more present, cutting out any of the low end rumble. Now with these back end vocals, all we're doing is cutting out. This is a great example of how sometimes you don't have to do anything. I'm just cutting out some of that low rumble, but I'm not actually doing anything on the CQ. Now, when you hear these, you might think, I wish you were here. well, those sound really dark. You should really add brightness, but that's not the goal of these vocals in the context of the mix. So you always have to be keeping everything in mind in the context of the mix. In this case, these vocals are adding a little bit of that low mid, low end fullness to the vocals in the context of the mix while still allowing the lead vocal to be really bright and prominent. I wish you were here and you will be next time. Sounds a little bit odd in solo, but it doesn't matter what it sounds like in solo. It matters how it sounds in the context of the mix. So you always wanna be thinking about that. And then again, by not adding brightness to these, I'm allowing these to sit further back. They're perceived as a little bit further away. And then with some of these other vocals, I'm actually taking away some of the brightness for the same reason. I'm cutting out some specific frequencies that sounded a little bit weird that weren't necessarily working. This is a good example here. I wish you were here just kind of has a telephony effect. So I just want to minimize that, really take a lot of that out. But for the most part, subtle moves, right? We're not doing huge moves. Most of these have small little changes. And then in this one case, on that one vocal, I'm kind of cutting out quite a bit at that one frequency and just helps it. It just fits a little bit better, tucks in a little bit better in the context of the mix. And then as we go through, again, some of these we're cutting out some of the low mids. I'm doing different EQs on different sources so that everything has their own space in the mix. It's not identical EQs across every vocal gets the exact same EQ. Every vocal gets treated a little bit differently depending on where I want it to be in the mix and the role I want it to have in the mix. Some of them I'm cutting out some of the high end if I want them to sit further back. Some of them I'm cutting out a lot of the high end if I really want them to sit back. And then some of them I'm actually adding a little bit of brightness if I'm trying to pull them a little bit forward. And as we get down into these oohs here, here I'm really trying to bring them way forward so they can sit kind of on top of the mix. So this ooze is a good example here. We did a big bump right up top there. And it just gives it this airy quality that really changes how it's perceived in the context of the mix. It allows it to sit really over the mix and up front in the mix as opposed to kind of tucked back in. So these oohs are a little bit more prominent while not being super far forward. We're allowing ourselves to add presence without necessarily adding volume. We've already set the static mix where we wanted it to be, but I'm able to bring out some of these other elements in different ways by adding presence at different frequencies so that things cut through and can all be heard at the same time. At the end of the day, there's only so much sonic space in the context of your mix. And so you need to be shaping everything a little bit individually. Now, again, we did a little bit on the master track, just one EQ on the master track that's doing the same goals. We're minimizing the bad, we're highlighting the good, we're bringing the overall tone of this mix closer to a reference track so that this is going to automatically be closer to a final mix with just this one EQ on the master track. If you haven't already seen it, watch my video I did last week on top-down mixing. This is a huge missed opportunity to jumpstart your mix to get it closer to the final product at the very beginning of your mix. After you've set your volumes and your pain positions, do a little bit of processing on your master track that all of your channels are going through. All of these individual channels go through these plugins at the very end. So by doing a little bit of processing here, we're jumpstarting our mix. And just this EQ and the EQ on the individual channels have completely transformed this mix and taken it from that muddy and dull sounding mix to that more final sounding mix that we heard at the beginning. Let's check it out one more time for good measure. I wish you were here with me next time I faced all my fears and that was all I need I wish you were here Turn up, please, and love is all I need.
Now, if you're a little overwhelmed by what I'm talking about in this video, I wanna give you something to help with that. I've put together a completely free EQ cheat sheet that just walks through what all the parts of an EQ are so you can understand how to use an EQ to create a better sounding mix. There's a link in the description below where you can download it completely free, so be sure to grab that. Before we go, I wanna hear from you. Do you use EQ in your mixes? How are you using EQ? Are you using EQ presets? Are you custom setting your EQs? Let me know in the comments below. If this video was helpful, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you next week with another video. One thing at a time, I can